There's a number of uh, well-known sentiment indexes looking at the state of mood in the Irish economy. So before I uh, start asking a question of Austin, I wanted to ask one of the room, which was just to judge the sentiment of the room. And it's a very simple question. Uh, comparing how you feel now with how you might have felt a year ago, uh, do you feel more or less optimistic about the state of the Irish economy? And I'd encourage now everyone who feels uh, more optimistic uh, if they could raise their hands. Okay. I'm going to call that about 25% of the room. Starting with that as our backdrop, Austin, um, we've got a slightly negative uh, view. People aren't feeling as buoyant as perhaps Minister Noonan um, or some of the media would have us, um, have us view the economy. Do you feel uh, more positive about where we're going in 2013? I feel an awful lot more positive than I did 12 months ago, but that's because 12 months ago things were particularly gloomy. It's interesting when you see such a small positive assessment of the economy, it's a reminder of just how difficult things are across the Irish economy at the moment. People are very uncertain about what's happening in the world economy and they've more immediate pressures in terms of what the budget has done to them in terms of uh, household spending power. So it's understandable that people aren't that positive. Uh, financial markets, on the other hand, are ragingly optimistic at the moment, probably excessively positive. But that reflects a different view of the world. Uh, financial markets are taking a view that the world hasn't ended. Twelve months ago they thought that we would either come a cropper because the Eurozone broke up or because America didn't get its act together on its budget or because China would simply just collapse. None of those things have happened and actually over the last three months or so we've seen developments that suggest the Euro is more likely to be round for quite a while to come. We've seen a cobbled together agreement on the US budgetary situation and most of the recent data from China have been positive. So the risk of things going horribly wrong has eased and because central banks are flooding the world with cheap money, financial markets think eventually this will kick in and get things going. It's a little bit like the gritting. Eventually, maybe sometime this afternoon, the gritters will <laughs> arrive. By the way, uh, I don't think you should think that's a part of cutbacks. I think that's a problem with public spending generally that the gritters come out two days after we see the snow. Um, but in terms of the sentiment measures, I think people are right to be cautious. That's what we're finding with our own consumer sentiment. They're still going to have a fairly tough year this year, but things are getting that little bit better for the Irish economy. And hopefully, if we're talking again in 12 months' time, people will realize it. But when it comes to, to consumer sentiment, there's a distinct absence of the feel good factor. There's nothing that actually makes you pop out of bed in the morning and feel much better about the working day to come. You're not earning an awful lot more. Your job prospects haven't improved dramatically. The government is going to take more money from you. So all those elements are causing consumers to be uncertain. Unfortunately, that means the economy as a whole finds it difficult to turn around. Normally economies go down and they come back up because at this time of the cycle, people start to believe, well, it can't get any worse. It must get a bit better. Things are cheap, house prices have come down, interest rates are low, maybe I should borrow a little bit more. All those traditional elements are lacking now, so it'll be a slow grind forward. Just to um, keep it topical, a lot of us will have heard this morning on the radio or reading the newspapers about the latest Exchequer returns figures for January. Uh, what did you feel they told us about the state of the economy and the government's finances particularly? Well, they probably didn't tell us, <coughs> excuse me, an awful lot. Uh, they're the first month in 12, and it's a little bit like putting your head outside the window this morning, seeing the snow and deciding that that was it for, for the next month. The reality is that these data tend to bounce about quite a bit. So it's a very early stages to make definitive pronouncements about the economy. That said, um, it's a sort of late, late show uh, set of numbers in that there's something for everyone in the audience. For the pessimists, there's VAT returns that were pretty poor, uh, only up 0.9%. And people are still worried about consumer spending in spite, and again, it would be interesting to hear what people here think, uh, retailers suggesting that they had a very good Christmas. So 
So that's quite disappointing and a little bit worrying. On the other side, for the optimists, income taxes were up very strongly, up 10%. And there, there are signs of life in the Irish economy. Again, we have an unemployment rate that's going to remain very high for a long time to come. But there are signs that we've moved from net losing jobs in the economy to a net situation where we're creating jobs. It doesn't mean that you won't see job loss announcements uh, over the next couple of months. Unfortunately, they'll remain a feature of the Irish economy. But there are signs that there's a bit more hiring going on. So the income tax receipts are telling you that's a good uh, aspect of it. Uh, in terms of the public spending, there are still controls uh, to be had there. There are still cutbacks. It actually could be next month before the gritters get out. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in terms of, there, generally the numbers are fairly measured. So. As I say, it's, it's too early to say, but for what you can take of it, by and large, tax revenues are suggesting employment may be starting to turn. Consumers are still reluctant to spend, but government spending seems to be broadly under control, with the notable exception of social welfare, which is still a problem area. You mentioned jobs there, and obviously there is great concern with the unemployment rate close to 15%. Um, I saw the ESRI last week as they downgraded their outlook for 2013, also suggesting that they don't think the actual rate of unemployment will drop much for up to, to three years. Is this a jobless recovery we're seeing? Yeah. All recoveries are jobless for the first couple of years. Companies tend to be very slow, and by and large you see the same written about every recovery since the Second World War. There's no jobs, and then they come, and they come in many instances quite strongly. I don't think it's going to be strong this time round because, as I say, consumers are cautious. People are still looking at the last big disaster, which was the crisis, and consequently they're being much more cautious in their spending. But we're seeing the unemployment numbers. The live register is down in each of the last seven months. It's down about a 1,000 a month, so it's no great shakes when you have 430,000 on the live register. But it is moving slowly in the right direction. Direction. That's about all you can expect. And because our economy is still producing lots of young people into the workforce, the unemployment rate's going to remain higher because every year we're seeing about 20,000 come into the workforce out of school and out of college. And there's still a significant potential from people who've migrated out of the country or still those who are still attracted to the economy because there are still people coming in here. So all those elements mean that the unemployment rate will be slow to ease down for a couple of years, much as it was in the early 90s. Mm. And then hopefully it will come down sharply. The critical element is there are signs now that we've moved from net job destruction mm. to net job creation. Okay, so we can be adding jobs even while the rate remains, remains roughly very the same. High. Yep. Just, you know, we read an awful lot about the government's debt situation, the many billions that we owe because of the recapitalization of the banking system and this dreaded pro note that has us all staying awake at night. Just how significant is uh, managing and dealing with that situation before the end of March in terms of uh, Ireland's finances and confidence that there is in the economy? It's very significant, probably on three or four different levels. Uh, it matters hugely to financial markets because if Ireland gets some deal to reduce the, uh, the current debt levels, then people are more likely to lend it extra money. Mm -hmm. To the extent that investors look at how much a country owes, the more it owes, the less likely they are to, to put new money in for fear they won't get that back. So any deal there is very important for financial markets. It's important technically in the sense that it brings down probably the extent of pain that we have to suffer over the next couple of budgets and that's still not insignificant. And probably third and most important, it's, it's hugely significant for sentiment. Um, I don't know how many people here know exactly what a promissory note is, but you've all heard of these things. You've heard a range of financial words and terms over the last while that you, you probably hoped you would never have to deal with in your life. And while you may not know the technicalities, you know from the somber way that, say, David Murphy mentions it on the six o'clock news, that it must be bad. Uh, so there are all those elements in terms of sentiment uh, that are very significant, that if we get a deal and David Murphy or Sean Whelan says, this is good, that people will feel that little bit better about the situation. And 
that's, that's quite important over the next while. And I suppose the final dimension, which I, I can't really talk about, there does seem to be signs of a significant political spat at government level where there are strains on a coalition, which is understandable in the current circumstances. So we need to have something. Now, uh, there are famous pictures of Chamberlain arriving home with a piece of paper saying, I've gotten peace. Um, uh, now, you could have a deal on the promissory notes that turns out to be a disaster. I'd be hopeful, however, that Europe will recognize that it needs to do something a little more substantial to get one pupil in the pa class passing the exam. All the others look like they're going to fail at the <laughs> moment. So the fact that if they can get the good boys uh, to actually pass a test and go back to market funding at the end of the year, that would be hugely important. So for all these reasons, I think getting a deal that people say this actually improves our lot is going to be significant. But I'd warn people it is not going to be a dramatic reduction in debt. The ECB aren't going to write off our loans and say we love the Irish, you know, we adore Kerry Gold and whatever else. Um, and you're not going to get anything like that because they're scared that then the Greeks will want it and all these others. So it will be some form of compromise and the devil will be in the detail. Okay, and just one more area I wanted to touch on before uh, throwing it open to the floor for, for people if they have any questions. Um, we're a nation obsessed with property. We have been through a roller coaster over the last 10 years. We've been up at the dizzy heights and we've crashed down 50 or 60% in terms of house price values. Um, are things stabilizing now, Austin? Um, the, the short answer is probably yes. The long probably answer yes. is a lot more <laughs> complicated. Um, uh, it, it would be nice to think of it as a roller coaster where even if you're down here, you know you're going back up. But the real issue for people in the market at the moment is a sense that property prices will never recover. Uh, and that is understandable after what's happened over the last couple of years. But if you look at what's happening in terms of the economy, if I'm right to suggest to you that employment is evening out, and remember, evening out to the point where maybe you see a few thousand extra jobs in the economy is hugely different to the circumstances of the last couple of years where you've lost 335,000 jobs. 15% of the people who were at work in the Irish economy in 2007 aren't working now. You know, it's a phenomenal amount. That means people without incomes. That, that's before you start thinking about all the tax increases, wage cuts that have hit other incomes and the issues in terms of credit. If employment starts to stabilize, people start to think about the future. They start to push their heads a little bit out of the bunker and start to say, well, maybe I need somewhere to live. Now, what that means is the property market will start to turn in really good areas, and by good areas, of course, I mean Dublin, not Cork, but uh, by, no, by good areas, I mean those areas where local conditions mean there is strong demand, which means there is uh, either employment opportunities close to it, good educational transport facilities around it, and not a huge overhang of supply. So you're going to see the end of the Irish property market, and I don't mean that in a negative sense, and the beginning of localised property markets where people look at the local area. So you are going to see price rises. You probably are seeing price rises in very limited segments. That will become more general, but you will also, also see other areas of the economy and the country where prices will continue to fall probably for the next five years. So the overall market will probably show a sign of improvement. We're seeing that in terms of turnover. We're seeing it, transactions are up. The National Property Price Register has helped to give people a sense of where prices are in their particular area. And to snoop on and your neighbors. And to snoop on their ears. So, you know, there's always a positive externality, as economists <laughs> would say. Uh, but you have those sort of elements there that are giving a little more certainty to the market. And if you believe banks, and we can 
talk about that maybe again, but there is a promise that there will be more mortgage funding available this year, maybe twice as much as there was last year. So all those elements point towards KBC a gradual open for turn. lending, by the way, ladies Exactly. And gentlemen. Yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't get the big <laughs> sign up in time. Uh, but in all those elements point you towards a stabilization. Because I'm saying to you, the economy doesn't come roaring out of the traps. I'm not saying, you know, get in now while you still can. Uh, there there will be opportunities, but there may not be opportunities to get that particular sun-drenched back garden in the particular road near to the schools and all those elements, you know. But so it is a changing market, and in that sense, although the short answer is probably yes, the longer answer says it depends where you are. I'm going to just develop one other theme we didn't talk about, which is the international dimension to what's affecting um, the Irish economy. Um, the sort of three elements to that that I want to touch on. Uh, first, uh, in the United Kingdom, the importance of that economy uh, to Ireland in terms of uh, where we export to, and a lot of talk around their role within the EU, their probability of them ever joining the Euro, and this speech from David Cameron where he's going to have a referendum putting it to the British people that they could even withdraw from the EU. How much of a threat is that for Ireland, and do you really think that that could happen? Well, I suppose it's seen as a lesser threat now than the more pressing threat, which has to do with uh, what Europe will do before the 31st of March, how the economy will come out of the recession. Something that may or may not happen in 2017 is probably a luxury that we don't have at the moment in terms of a concern. Uh, there is a broad sense in the financial markets that they haven't paid a lot of attention to it again because there are more pressing issues. Now, Sterling a little bit weaker over the last uh, week or so, but that's more to do with the euro being strong than people really junking sterling. Uh, there is a sense there that uh, in terms of what the UK is trying to do, uh, there's a schizophrenic element to it. One which says, look how bad Europe has been over the last while, so of course it makes sense for any economy that can to try and reorder its relationship with Europe. And the other element is, of course, well, the UK never wanted to be part of Europe. Mm. They, they love that channel and they want to remain cut off as long as possible. Um, the truth it lies somewhere in the middle. The UK is a very important element in Europe as a counterweight to Germany. Uh, it's very important in terms of Ireland as in many instances, uh, a country that thinks in a like manner to ourselves in terms of legislation, particularly taxation at the moment. So it's very important there. It's important as a trading partner. Um, I, I think you will see Europe make some sort of concessions to the UK and with a little bit of luck, we'll avoid a damaging UK exit. Um, of course, there's a risk, it's probably less than one in four, but that's not insignificant. And if the UK were to leave, it would cause us problems. There might be some gains because companies might locate here, but net, they're our biggest trading partner, it would add to uncertainty. So it will be an issue that we will come round to think about, but it would be brilliant if that was the problem we were most focused on yeah. at the moment. That's a luxury we don't have at the moment. And just to touch finally on, on a third important trading block or partner of Ireland, the United States, where you know, US stock markets are booming. Um, there is this concern around the so-called fiscal cliff and the government's balance sheet. Can the US start to motor along in terms of growth enough to start lifting all the boats? Uh, short answer there would be no. The US economy is going to have modest growth because a bit like Ireland, its consumers have overspent. They do need to retrace. It's quite interesting though because they haven't had budget austerity. Consumer spending has pulled the economy along for the last year or two. They're likely to have growth around 2% this year. The UK somewhere around 1% and Europe either side of flat. So the US economy will muddle through uh, because whatever is needed will be done there. And that's the critical aspect. There is a can-do attitude. Just um, one final point, Austin, around um, Ireland's export se uh, sector, which has been one of the very well, you know, good performing areas of the economy. And food is a big part of that, mm -hmm. 9 billion 
euros last year in food exports and, and of that I understand beef being two billion. You know, we hear in new headlines this beef story, it seems to run and run. Is this you know, it's obviously important to the to the farming sector and the meat industry, but is you know, is this a, a big part of Ireland's export economy that's very important? Uh, it is a big part of it and uh, it is a part that you'd hope would be hugely more influential over the next five to ten years. There are ambitious targets uh, for the food sector in Ireland uh, over the ne out to 2020. Um, the issue there is that we have to have an industry that's seen to be beyond any question uh, and that is hugely important. There, it's a major competitive uh, element for the Irish economy, our food, our environment, and it's really something that once we get a little less focus on the crisis, we need to turn attention to hugely in terms of building something that is regarded rightly as world class. In terms of the current controversy, uh, it's, it's a dreadful mess, but the huge importance will be how we deal with it, how rigorous we are, how quickly we come to terms with it. And the worst situation is where over the next six months you continue to hear a week after a week after a week mm. that there is some other strange form of animal found in some other strange form of burger or whatever. So y you need to, to actually get this uh, curtailed very quickly and in those circumstances there's certainly a very significant capacity in the Irish economy. If you remember the boom, right, <laughs> if you remember back those blissful days, <laughs> um, the boom was built on a couple of things. It was built on false promises, it was built on cheap money and it was built on unrealistic expectations. But it was also built on competitive strengths of the economy. We had had an export boom that suggested there were very strong capacities in the Irish economy to actually develop uh, a services export industry on a significant scale. That is coming to fruition. There was also this sense that we have an environment that we're really blessed with, that in a world where resources are going to be a huge issue over the next 20 to 30 years, we have a tremendous chance to, to be a world leader. Um, and we also have a demographic that's hugely favorable. So those elements which we lost the run of ourselves in terms in the boom, but those elements are still largely in place there. And the added element, which is kept by the way foreign direct investment very positive, is that there's a flexibility. You probably know yourselves, bad things happen to good companies, but where good companies show themselves capable is how they respond to them, what they do. And we've seen a very significant improvement in competitiveness. We've seen you yourselves all know, and you're still all pessimistic about it, all the pain you're taking at a personal and a business level to do these adjustments. But that is being watched from overseas, and that is giving very positive signals about the Irish economy. So those elements are still factors we build on. The food industry is a really important block in that, and how we handle the crisis over the next while is going to be quite significant in terms of the outlook, as I say, beyond the crisis. Well, Austin, I think we're going to come to an end there on what I would call a note of guarded optimism, which I hope is probably an appropriate way to look at this year. I hope the 25% of the people in the room who think it's going to get better are right and that the 75% of you who aren't so sure are all totally wrong. May uh, your businesses and your clients have a great 2013 and could you join me in thanking Austin Hughes of KBC uh, Bank saying thank you for your time this morning.